questions, please. Yes, sir. tells exactly how we got together. It was 1933. If you remember, there was a frightful depression on in our country. Millions were unemployed. In New York City, you would go through the tunnel into Gimbel's from, say, the square where Gimbel's begins. It goes all the way through to the, uh, by the Holland Tunnel. They were sleeping with the provision of the mayor. Three and four deep as far as the eye could go. There's no place to go. In the park, in the summer months, they were allowed to sleep in the park, sleep all over the place. And the long lines for coffee and bread were there to get them. There were millions unemployed. We then had a population of not more than, say, 130 million, as against today it's 192 million. I was a dancer, and if you couldn't eat, you couldn't pay to watch a dancer. So there were no shows playing on Broadway. I think we had five Broadway shows. And they were running on paper. Yes, we were passing on paper to go and see them, really. Instead of the usual 50 and 60 shows that you used to get. Well, what I'm getting at, I didn't have a job, I had no money, and I was living in a basement on 75th Street, and he lived on 72nd Street, in a very lovely home that was owned by Morgan Thorne, whose son was then the treasury of, the, uh, of our country, a cabinet member. But his father owned this house. But he didn't live there, and he rented the first floor to my friend Abdullah. I said to Abdullah, in the month of October, late October, Abdullah you know, had been gone from Barbados for almost 12 years, came here in 22. And it's almost 12 years, I've never had a desire to go back. But now I have a hungry desire, a hunting desire, to go to Barbados. Now the thing stops me, but the lack of money, I have no money. He said to me, you are in Barbados. I said, I'm in Barbados. He said, yes, you are now in Barbados. And so, you see Barbados, and you see America from Barbados, and you can smell the tropical land of Barbados, see only the little homes of Barbados, and that's all you do. You just simply sleep this night in Barbados. Well, I thought him insane, really. I mean, at the moment, it seemed so stupid, because 72nd Street, he still had... 50 and 60 story buildings. And little Barbados with a little three story building, almost the tallest that you find. And narrow little streets and no sidewalks. And I'm walking on a sidewalk wider than the wide street of Barbados on 72nd Street. But nevertheless, that night I slept in Barbados. I assumed that I'm in Barbados in my mother's home. And then I saw America relative to Barbados. And it wasn't under me that night, it was north of me about 2,000 miles. Well, the next day, I didn't tell him anything. But a week later, when nothing happened, I thought I would approach him. This time, it moved into November. I said, you know, Ab, there is no, uh, not a thing has happened. He wouldn't discuss it with me. He turned his back on me and went into his little library and slammed the door. About three times, I tried to open up a discussion with my friend Ab between that moment when I first talked to him and the end. He would never discuss it. On the basis, how can he discuss with me how I am going to Barbados when I am already in Barbados? That's stupid to discuss how I'm going to go when I am in Barbados. And if I am faithful to my assumption, I can't discuss the how. I am already there. Well, this went on. On the morning of the fourth day of December, there's no job, no place to go, and the last boat that would get me there, my Christmas, is going to sail on the 6th. Under my door is a little letter from my brother Victor. And he said, as a family, we were never around the table at Christmas together. That season, that is my oldest brother, he left home before the last was born. Because we have a large family, there's eight, about eight years between my sister, Daphne, who was the eighth child, and then my brother, Joe. But in that interval, my brother Cecil went off to Demerara. So, never as a family were we ever together at Christmas. So in the letter, he justifies why he's asked me to come. He said, I know you don't have a job, and there's no excuse for not coming. And so I'm enclosing a draft for $50. You may need a shirt, a pair of shoes, socks, or something. And I've notified the furnace witty line that you'll come for a ticket. 
so the ticket is waiting for you at the furnace line. Well, I was so excited, I rushed on down to the furnace line, and I told, gave them my letter. They said, yes, we have uh, a message here from your family in Barbados. We'll give you a ticket, but we haven't any first class tickets left. You can go, you can go third class and use the facilities at the first, but you have to sleep third class until you hit the island of St. Thomas. When you hit St. Thomas, someone disembarks, then you may take a first class bunk. I said, I'll take it. I rushed right up to Abdullah. And I said, Ab, I have my ticket for Barbados, but I have to go third class. I am only elated and happy about it. He said, who told you that you're going to Barbados? And who told you that you went to Barbados third class? You went to Barbados and you went first class. But say no more. He isn't even happy that I'm going to Barbados now. So I went down on the morning of the 6th day of December with my third class ticket. I went up to the desk as they're checking in the passengers, and I put my ticket forward. He said, I've got good news for you, Mr. Goddard. Someone is cancelled, and you're going first class. And I went first class, all the way down to Barbados. Ten days down, ten days back, with three heavenly months in Barbados. So all that I did, I tried to the best of my ability, but his, I would call almost insolence. He was rude. But he taught me by his rudeness that I cannot discuss how if I am doing what I'm supposed to do, he tells me right away, you are in Barbados. Like someone comes to you now, and you would apply this principle towards their request, and they say, oh, I would love to be happily married. And you say to her or him, you are now happily married. They look at you as though you're insane. But that's exactly what you're supposed to do. You are now happily married. But if I am now happily married, I'm a lady, I would instantly begin to feel that ring well in my imagination. I'd let others see that I have my ring, but that would imply I'm happily married to my ring. And so if I don't wear it from then on, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. So in my imagination, I have to go to bed wearing my ring. And actually do all that I would do in that state. Well, he said, you were in Barbados. And I'm in New York City physically, but he put me in Barbados in my imagination. So that I slept in Barbados to the best of my ability. But you know, days go into weeks, and the weeks went into a month. And I'm trying my best to open up a discussion with him to get a little hope. No, no hope. He wouldn't give me any encouragement if I did what he told me to do. But we all are human enough to want another little discussion, another little push. And so he taught me the lesson that there is no such thing as a little pregnancy. No such thing. If you did it, then you're pregnant. Let the child grow. And interference with it is going to be a miscarriage. You assume that you are in Barbados. Now you're pregnant. The idea is you're going to give birth to a journey and pursue a land you like in Barbados. So you, can, you must assume that. That is conception. Now, don't try to argue. You want to conceive. And all you have to do is to be a faithful mother and bear that child. And don't discuss it with me anymore. He never discussed it after he told me I was in Barbados. And I learned so many things from the old fellow. I came back because I wasn't drinking. I brought him two lovely old bottles of brandy. The best that we had in the island. Two lovely bottles. And of some rum. So I gave him my father's rum. Gave him the brandy. A week later, he said to me, Say, how long do you expect those things to last? learned my lesson. I thought he would sip those things for a year. Oh no, they were gone. And he wondered how long I suppose these things to last for him. And of course he really disillusioned me terribly on so many things because I would go and dine with him and after him, I was on a strict vegetarian. I was trying to overcome it after I came back gradually. And of course he would sit down and he would have two or three big shots of rye. I mean big shots of rye. And then he would wash down his meal with a lot of porter, or it wasn't where it was a pail. And then he would, at the end, like Churchill, a huge big bowl of ice cream. And he said, Al, how can you do that? Oh, he said, you couldn't do it, it was you, because you had fribbles. But you know that God made everything? Everything is God. You will see he made something and not the grass? No, God made everything. And he'll send it back to the Bible. Go back to the Bible and read the book of Acts. And Peter couldn't eat the unclean thing. And then the Lord said, Slay me, for that which I have claimed, I have claimed. Then a sheep came down, filled with all manner of animals and food. And the 
what is there to be dismay and eat? For that which I have cleansed, I have cleansed. So he said, you have cripples level. With any of your cripples, it portion you. But he would sit down and polish off this enormous meal, and wash it down with ale, precede it with three shots of rye. And, and here was a man, truly of the spirit. But if I judge for appearances, I would say, well, he can't be a holy man, for which today I'm most grateful that he wasn't, because he taught me real Christianity. And he was born in North Africa of Jewish parents and raised in a strict Orthodox Jewish home. But he knew more Christianity than anyone I've ever met, because he spoke the Hebrew tongue perfectly. He spoke other tongues, and rabbis would come to study with him. And he and I would discuss day in and day out for all five years, teaching me all that he could teach me that I could have saw concerning the Kabbalah, the great mystery of how this thing is put together in these simple little letters of Hebrew. I know that in the, uh, before the Civil Rights Bill, in New York City, no Negro could go to the box office and buy a seat in the orchestra. You get a seat in the balcony. You think that bill would ever let me go and buy the seats? No. But they would go right straight down to the box office. And he was a Negro, I tell you. And you go right down and say, I want two in the center. I don't want too far back, not beyond the sixth row, right in the center. Yes, sir. Buy the two seats. For any show. The first offer I saw, Abdullah took me to it. It was possible. Five hours, and I'd never seen one before. It seemed it would never come to an end. Of all the offers to be introduced to opera through possible, Good Friday it was too. You go on Good Friday in New York, except when you go to possible. And you sit there and you my Lord, is it ever going to come to an end? And he is drinking it in, every little note he understands, every little point. And he's so in love with it. And I'm sitting because I'm next to have just waiting, hoping. But nothing happens. It goes on and on and on. And it's five hours later. 